let you guys dig out the gold out of the word yourself. I was going to preach a sermon called The Three Platforms. I've had this rolling around in my spirit for a couple of months, actually, six weeks probably, and I can't seem to get it. The Lord just couldn't, I just couldn't seem like I could get this out on paper to figure out how, how I was going to do it from here. So when I, finally, when I could finally have an ear to hear the word within the word, I decided that I'm going to give you guys these 12 issues that are on this page. This is, if you pay attention to quotation marks on those, on those pages, the quotation marks are directly out of the platform, directly out of the core values that the two parties represent, the two parties and what they, what they embrace, those two things. And the, uh, did everybody get one? It looks like some people are shaking their head, they don't have one. We missed some over here. Where's the extra ones at? Joe, Justin, you got some more of those? Did you run out? You ran out. Okay, Kath, would you please? Folks back here. Is it color? Some of them came out black and white, some like, yeah, that's it. it. The master's on the copying machine in the document tray. Go ahead. There's a lot that didn't get it, okay. Uh, that's a good problem to have. We have lots of paper, not a problem. We have big thing, things of toner. So we have this exercise for you guys to do, okay? This is the exercise. You have the core values of the two parties. And your job is to develop a kingdom platform. Okay, I just got done saying how many of you are not of this world. You know, there's a government that rules our lives that is superior to the government of the American uh, Constitution and, and all those kinds of things. There is, whatever, whatever happens in America, obviously we're gonna be impacted by that. Decisions that are made by our politicians are impacting our nation on a continuous basis, constantly. But there's something about being a dual, having dual citizenship that you can become immune in some areas by, the, by having your second citizenship. We are citizens of heaven, the scripture says. If you know Jesus as your personal savior, you are a citizen of heaven. And the, and the government that rules, my, rules me is not the government of this world. It's the government of the kingdom of God. So when you have a kingdom of God perspective about yourself, you have a kingdom of God perspective, and you stand on the platform of the kingdom of God, what this platform represents right here, as long as I'm alive and as long as I'm in charge here, there isn't going to be uh, philosophical, theological, and atheistic worldviews are going to be propagated from this platform. This platform, this place, this building is dedicated to the glory of Jesus Christ, the King of Kings, Amen. the Lord of Lords. Yes. One day, one day, every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to God's glory. That's going to happen. I am so grateful for you in this room, you who are listening on the uh, uh, live today on the, on the TV. Welcome, Facebook family. And I'm so glad for myself that I've done that voluntarily while I still have the will to surrender myself to Jesus as my Lord and my Savior. And I've knelt down and received him as my personal Savior and I confessed my need to him for a Savior, that I am a sinner who needs to be forgiven that I might be able to have my name in the book of life. And I am so grateful that I have done that here. There are people that have refused to do that, even with their dying breath. There have been people who refused to acknowledge God on their deathbeds. And one day they're going to kneel. And one day they're going to bow. And one day they're going to confess that Jesus is Lord. But the problem is it's going to be too late for them. The judgment's going to be placed upon them because they refuse to do it on this side of the grave, saints. There's no second chances on the other side of the grave. It's on this side of the grave that we need to make a stand for Jesus. So as you do that exercise, as you do that exercise, you can see there's very, very simple instructions. Read the two platforms, ponder and think about what a kingdom of God platform would be. Think about what, if Jesus was running for the president of the United States, you know, what would he say his platform is? Think of it that way. And I want you to dig up some scriptures so you have some proof text to support it. And I want you to write out your platform. So I think it's a great exercise to see the difference between the platforms and to recognize that your life, there's two things here. I want you to, I want you to have clarity. There is so much 
There is a spirit of confusion upon our nation right, like, right now like I have never seen in my life. It's unbelievable. It's, it's not, it didn't just start here in the last couple of months. It's been going on for the last four years or more. You know, we have this thing, we have gender dysphoria on, in, in America where people don't know if they're male or they're female or they change their mind multiple times in a day. Google Facebook gender preferences. Google that. There's 52 different gender preferences that you can pick on your Facebook profile. The one that's most heinous is two-spirited. You're, you're admitting that you have two spirits. You're admitting that you're demon-possessed. Two-spirited. I don't even know what it means, but that's what it means to me. If you have two spirits, you have your own spirit and you've got another spirit in there. If it's not the Holy Spirit, then it's some kind of ungodly spirit. You know? So we have this confusion that's in our nation. You know, with all of the all of the yah yah that's being sent out there on commercials and 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 everybody lying and everything, you can't even figure out what's up and what's down, who believes what, who doesn't believe what. I mean, it's very confusing. I, I'm a, I'm like at least an, an average intelligent guy, and I'm confused by watching all this stuff. So I know that there's a platform that I stand upon, and a platform that I believe, and a platform that I represent here at Wildwood Chapel. And I know that you would have that same, that you wouldn't be here if you didn't have that same platform. So I want you to help deliver, develop your platform. And then as voters, this is simply what we got to do. We have to find out who the candidate is. I don't care if they represent an elephant or if they represent a donkey because I represent the lamb. Okay? I'm going to vote for the individual that most represents, which most parallels my platform, the platform of the kingdom of God. The platform of the platform of the of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm going to find the candidate that most you know most represents that, and cast my vote in that place. I don't have to like their personality. I don't have to like their appearance. This is not a popularity contest. You know, you vote for the president of your school class because they're the most popular person. It has nothing to do with character. Has nothing to do with morals. Has nothing to do with anything other than they're the most popular person. So we vote that person in to be our, our school class president. That's not what we're, what we're talking about here. You know, and, and you need to devoid yourself from party alliance. This is not kingdom thinking. Well, my great granddaddy was a Republican. My granddaddy was a Republican and my daddy's now I'm gonna die a Republican. I just vote straight Republican every time. Or the other way around, Democrat. You could say it either way, you know. It's not about that, it's about it's about, it's about, when we pray this, saints, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Yeah. We have a part to play in that. And it's pushing that button or lever or whatever it is that you do. You better be voting for the kingdom. Your, your vote is going to determine to what degree the kingdom of God is able to come here. In Timothy, the scripture says, pray for all those that have authority over you, for the kings and for the rulers that it might go well and be peaceable so that all men can come to know Jesus. We have a hostile, Jesus hostile culture in, our, in America right now. We have, we have individuals running for all kinds of offices all across the land who are despisers of the truth of the gospel, who, who want to remove the American and God we trust from, the, from, uh, from, the, from everywhere that they can. They want, to remove, they want to remove that from society and every area of society. There are politicians that want to take away our religious freedoms and find people who say anything that is contrary that does not align up with their platform. Direct violation of our constitutional rights and freedoms, saints. I'm telling you what. What we do every single day and what we do on election day is going to echo into eternity. Yeah. And I am praying like a house on fire. That's why I have these, I have these uh, prayer guides, um, or these uh, yeah, prayer guides we've been doing. And I hope that every single one of you are taking time. You know, turn off your television set for 30 minutes once during the day and get the prayer guide and read through that prayer guide and pray. Can you do that? Do that, every one of us, we need to pray. It's one thing we can do. What can I do? I'm only one person in this one little drop of sand in the, in the grains of sand of humanity of eight and a half billion people on the planet. You can stand in the gap and you can pray. You can, stand, you can make a difference. You can make an eternal difference. 
Turn with me to Ezekiel, chapter 22. Ezekiel chapter 22. Let's pray. I didn't even pray. I just got up here and started. Took off, took off with uh, that. You can stay seated. I'm just going to pray. Lord, there's a fire in me right now, Lord God. I just pray that that fire would come out of me in a way that would impact my brothers and my sisters, would impact all those around us. Lord, I pray that we'd raise up righteous people all across this land to stand in the gap, to pray to intercede, to push back darkness, to light up your kingdom, that we might see, truly might see, revival in the churches where it needs to begin first, Lord. Revival in us, revival in me, that we would be revived, we would return, return to our first love and our first passion for Jesus. That we, would be, we would just fall in love with you again, Jesus, deeper than we've ever had before. We would become fully committed to you, that we would live a life that is without compromise, and we would live according to the convictions of your word, Lord. God, I pray that each of us would be a banner set high in the workplace, in the neighborhood, and within our families of righteousness. That we would, be, that we would show what it means to be a servant of the Most High God. We would show what it ne- means by our, by our words, by our actions, by our lifestyle. Uh, what it means to be a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. What it means to truly be a disciple. That everyone would know that we're your disciples by the love that we have one for another. Father, I ask that you light a fresh fire, fresh passion within us for your power and for your presence and for your glory. I ask for your anointing upon this word, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'm serious about that, that paper. I'd love to hear what your thoughts were. That's a pretty good, pretty, uh, there's 12 issues there. It takes, it'll be a lot of work to do that. But, you know, pick some issues that are, read through those. Pick at least, pick it, please do this. Everyone, read through those 12 issues on that paper. Please, please promise me you'll do that. And you'll pick at least two of them that you're most passionate about and find some scriptures and write a kingdom of God platform. What a kingdom of God platform would look like in your own words. It doesn't have to be eloquent. It doesn't have to be anything. If you find something and you like it, email it to me. I'd like to see it. With your permission, I'll read it. Uh, if you don't want your name uh, said, I'll, I'll not read it the following week. Another thing I want you to do, I want everybody, I want to see this room twice as filled as it is next Monday, not tomorrow or the week from that, no, Monday night before the election. Okay, what is that, the 2nd? Yeah. October 2nd. That Monday night, we're going to have a prayer and praise gathering here, and we're going to pray through uh, some of these things we've been talking about, some of the prayer guides. I'm going to ask people to pray. We're going to have the worship team here. We're going to worship. And, you know, there's multiple places in the, in the scriptures where a battle was won by sending Judah first. Judah, is, Judah was the worshipers. Judah's, Judah was the whole house, the tribe of Israel that had the priests, uh, or the worshipers, the, 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 song, the uh, dancers, the singers, and all those other kinds of things. There's a song we used to sing years ago here. Even before we were in here, we used to sing it over in the old chapel. Send Judah first, and the battle will be won. Send Judah first, and the foe is overcome. Singing praise to the Father and glory to the Son. Send Judah first. And it comes out of the passage of Scripture that talks about uh, Hezekiah sending out the, the worship team in front of the army. And when they got to the enemy, all of the enemy had drawn their swords upon each other and they wiped themselves all out. And they never even drew, pulled their sword out of the sheath. They didn't even, didn't even let alone swing their sword. Never even pulled it out of the sheath because, because praise went forward, anointing went forward, and the enemy was defeated, saints. Light always wins over darkness. The Bible says that we're not allowed, we shouldn't put our light under a basket. But we should bring it out and let all men see the light of God that's within us. Jesus is the light of men. He's the light of the world. Saying so, we, we need to become vigilant in this. We need to stir up. You know, you know, every single vote counts. Don't think, oh, I'm just, what's one more vote? Every, count, every vote counts. You need to encourage people, like-minded people, to vote. You need to be active in this. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Okay, maybe we'll get to the message here. Um, 
<laughs> Amen. Thanks, brother. Ezekiel 22. I'm going to read through 23, uh, chapter, verse 23 to 31. Israel's in a bad way. God's about to bring judgment upon Israel. Uh, and Israel, if we took the time to read the whole chapter, in the earlier, ver earlier verses in chapter 22, it talks about the sexual immorality was so horrible that they're having sex with their daughters. And there's, there's just, you know, there's incest going on, saints. Incest is going on. Our country has lost its moral compass. You know, we, we, our country is, there are people in our country that are called good evil and evil good. There's nothing good about same-sex relationships. The scriptures are clear about it. Nothing good about it. People that are trapped in that are hurting. They need, they need the healing of Jesus. They need the brokenness of their soul healed. We need to love them, not judge them. We need to give them the same grace to grow and to, and to transform that was given to us, that Jesus gives to us. We can't expect instant sanctification. How many of you, be, how many of you got saved, and by the, but before you went to bed the day you got saved, every sinful activity in your life was gone? Everything that you did wrong was gone, and you, and you were walking for Jesus, you know, talking and, and preaching the gospel and saving souls and raising the dead instantly, right, within the 12, first 12 hours, right? No, it's been a process, you know. You know, he's still working on me to make me what I ought to be. You know, he took him a day to make the sun and the moon and the stars, but it's, he's still working on me. So we're all a work in progress. So we need to extend the grace. We need to extend the love to these individuals. We are their only hope. Jesus is their only hope. But we are the representatives of Jesus, saints. The church has failed that whole community horribly. One end of the spectrum is, it's okay, we love you, God loves you, it's okay, anything you do is fine. We have that, you know, that, that uh, greasy grace that it does nothing. It is, is anti-biblical. We have the other end that brings about tremendous judgment and condemnation and guilt and, and excommunication and, and separation. And the very hope of the gospel has been, has been withheld from the brokenness of the LGBT community because of the, these two far extremes. We've got to find ourselves in the place where we can love these people in the wholeness. We can bring these people. We need to not reject them. We need to love them. Jesus hung out with sinners. He was called a sinner because he hung out with the sinners. You know, he would go to he, they, the, the religious community was upset with Jesus because he went to Zacchaeus. And said, this day I'm coming to your house. Zacchaeus was one of the most hated people because he was a Jewish person collecting Roman taxes against, against his fellow Jewish citizens. He was hated and despised by that. You know, so, but Jesus had compassion on that. So we need to, we need to move with compassion. But we see, this, we see the sexual immorality that was going on. We see the corruption that was going on. I mean, it mirrors what's going on in America today. You know, take, it, take some time this afternoon and look through the rest of those verses in 22. Beginning at 23, God is speaking. And the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, say to her, you are a land that is not cleansed or rained on in the day of indignation. The conspiracy of her prophets in her midst is like a roaring lion tearing the prey. They have devoured people. They have taken treasure and precious things. They have made many widows in their midst. My priests have violated my law and profaned my holy things. They have not dis, uh, distinguished between the holy and the unholy, nor have they made known the difference between the unclean and the clean. And they have hidden their eyes from my Sabbath so that I am profaned among them. Her princes in her midst are like wolves, tearing the prey to shed blood, to destroy people, and to get dishonest gain. Her prophets plastered them with untempered mortar, seeing false visions and, uh, and divining lies for them, saying the Lord had not spoken. The people of the land have used oppression, committed robbery, and mistreated the poor and the needy, and they wrongfully op oppress the stranger. Verse 30. So I sought for a man among them who would make a wall and stand in the gap before me on behalf of the land that I should not destroy it, but I found none. I found none. Verse 31. 
Therefore I have poured out my indignation on them. I have consumed them with the fire of my wrath. And I have recompensed their deeds on their own heads, says the Lord. The Bible says whatever a man sows, that shall he also reap. That's a, that's a kingdom principle. It's a spiritual law. And just because something bad happens to you because you've sown bad things, you can't blame God for that. Amen. No, you can't blame God for that. So even if God does not bring his judgment upon America, I don't believe he's done with America yet. I don't believe coronavirus. I've said this before. The, 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 the coronavirus, I don't believe, is a judgment from God. I don't believe, I don't believe that. Everything that's good comes from God. You know, I believe that if you, if you look at the coronavirus, they violated God's principles because they're eating all these horrible, unclean, nasty creatures and eating bats it produced the coronavirus and it spread across the world. Leviticus says very plainly, those are unclean things. You're not supposed to eat those kinds of things. You know, so, so that is just sowing and reaping, if you want to look at it that way. You know, maybe God has brought the, the virus. And if he did, it's going to turn out to be a good thing. I can tell you that. Because his judgment is good. His correction is good. His chastisement is good. Brings about the peaceable fruit of righteousness on the planet and in individuals. How many of you, how many of you can tr totally trust God that whatever, whatever, whatever life throws at you, whatever the devil puts in front of you, whatever happens, God is going to work it out in some way for your good. Is he not? Yes. Amen. That's the kind of God we serve, saints. That's the kind of God... He works all things together for good to those that are called according to his purposes. Every, he works those things to good. So I hope that you're, you've been called to the purposes of God, and you're not calling God to your purposes. You understand what I'm saying here? There's quite a difference there. You know, you're not, and, it, and it's so interesting to even see this. You know, the church in America has lost it. The church, that one thing I said about, the two extremes. You know, we have some denominations that are, that are exalting homosexuality and raising people to high positions within the, within the, uh, the uh, politics of their, of their denomination. We have that going on at one end. We have, the other end, uh, other, we have another spectrum of, of uh, churches that are milking the people from their money. When I hear preachers saying on the radio and on the TV and stuff, God is showing me that if you send me a hundred dollars and I'll, he's going to return you tenfold and you, for the next hundred people that send a hundred dollars, they're going to receive a thousand dollars in return. Jesus. Call them to another profession, please. Or bring repentance upon them that they would publicly denounce their manipulation of people and, and milking of people for money for their own, for their own uh, advancement of their own kingdom. It would be one thing if they were sowing all that money into the kingdom and winning souls, but they're sowing it into their flesh, yeah. buying houses and yachts and, mm -hmm. and airplanes and whatever else they, yeah. their, their, their uh, desires are. Come up with bogus reasons as to why they can justify that kind of, a, mm -hmm. that kind of, a, of a misuse of God's money. Taking widows' last might with manipulations, promises, misrepresentation of God's word. There was a time for years and years and years in American history where a clergy person had the equal respect that a doctor would have or a lawyer would have or a judge would have. It was an honored position. For the most part, these individuals lived up to the moral standards that were necessary to receive the honor for that position. Now it's a joke on every kind of night program there is are making jokes about, about ministers. And it's justified. They have, the, they have enough material, they have enough of, enough of these shenanigans going on that they're able to draw from these individuals and, and make a mockery of this. We have pastors who are taking the word of God and using it for their own benefit. Teaching people to use the word of God for their own benefit. There's nothing wrong with being wealthy, but if you're hoarding the wealth upon yourself, then you're a horrible steward of what God's given to you. Amen. You know, you are. 
to take your wealth, you need to invest it in something where moth and rust doesn't make it corrupt. You know, I can remember years ago, I can remember years ago when I had my auto business. This is, I've been a pastor for 19 years. This is back when I had my business, had the radio on, had my radio on Word FM. And um, actually it was called, what was it called then? WPIT. Uh, we preach WPIT, I forgot what it stood for, but it was, that was the call letters of the radio station before it became Word FM 101.5. Uh, and the guy was on the radio. This is in the 80s. He was on the radio saying, if you're not driving a car that costs at least $35,000, and you don't have a home that costs at least $150,000, there's a, one or two reasons for that. Either you have sin in your life or you have a lack of faith. I screamed. I heard it on the radio. I could tell you his name. You know his name. I'm not going to tell you his name. And I heard that on the radio. And I said his name. I says, take that to the persecuted church and tell them that they have a lack of faith and they don't have money, and they don't have a, they don't have a car, they're, and they're walking, and they're giving their lives for Jesus because they won't say no to Muslim or to the, to the pagans or whatever it is that's crucifying them. That's a doctrine of devils is what that is. You have good theology when it can go, you know that you have sound theology when it comes directly from the scriptures, and it can translate to any generation forward and backward, and it can translate to any culture, Amen. any culture. The American gospel is not the gospel. It is not the true gospel. Verse 30. Saints, I'm calling you. I'm calling you. Verse 30. So I sought for a man among them who would make a wall and stand in the gap before me on behalf of the land that I should not destroy it, but I found none. I think God's got that call right now. America, what's it going to be? What's your future going to be, America? You have the opportunity to make history. Every one of us in this room have the opportunity to make history by how we live our lives, how we cast our votes, what we stand for. We stand on the platform of the kingdom of God and doing the best job we possibly can of aligning ourselves with candidates to stand on whatever, whatever political platform they're upon, whichever one of those individuals aligns themselves the best they, to, the best, to, the, to that platform. In many ways, to me, it's almost, all, it's almost a, single, it's a single issue it's abortion. You know, talk about innocent blood. You know, what about the rights of children? What about rights? You know, the church is, is, keeps silent on that. They shut their mouth on that. Why? Because there's lots of people in the, in the churches that have had that. And it's a horrible thing. And I know people. Uh, there may or may be somebody here today that has had an abortion. Either before you were a Christian or after you were a Christian. The blood of Jesus cleanses you from all of your unrighteousness, saints. You, know, that you, you can bring that to Jesus. You can have it forgiven. You can be healed of the deep wound that's going to be there. It'll, it'll be a wound and a scar and a pain you'll carry the rest of your life. But Jesus can, can see you through that and forgive you for that. How many of you are for women's rights? I'm for women's rights. You better put your hand up. If you're, a, if you're a Christian, you ought to be for women's rights. How is that defined? Look on those platforms and see how they're defined quite differently. Quite differently, it's defined. So this, this standing on the gap, standing on the gap. You know, you know guys, we, a couple weeks ago I preached a message and I started off with, it was, a, it was just like the fourth part of this prayer thing that I've been doing. It was the very first message, and I talked about the, uh, the um, two kinds of uh, the conditional will of God and the unconditional will of God. Remember we talked about that? How there are certain things where God has just inserted himself into humanity, and he doesn't need our permission to do it at all, because he's God. This is his planet. You know, he can do whatever he wants to do. But he has chosen within his sovereignty to be intricately involved with mankind. And we have, there are, there are unconditional conditions of grace, right? 
unconditional conditions of grace. If you believe in your heart that Jesus is the Son of God, and if you confess with your mouth, then you're what? You're saved. It's conditional, isn't it? The Bible says that God desires that all men everywhere would repent. God desires that everyone would come to the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. God desires that. It's God's will that none should repent. Does that mean that the none should perish? Does that mean that everybody's going to go to heaven? No. That's his desire. It's his purpose. He desires that for mankind. But it's based upon us. He has provided salvation for every single person on the planet. It's been provided there. And it's up to us to receive that. It's conditional. It's conditional on our, on our receiving Christ as our Savior. We have the situation, God, the situation in Israel is so bleak, very similar to the way our nation is right now. Very simil similar parallel, parallel there. And God says, judgment is, is, is coming. Judgment's coming. But is there anybody who is going to stand in the gap and make up a wall that, I, that we can circumvent this judgment? The Bible says that we're co-laborers with Jesus. We're co-partners with the Holy Spirit. So, there, so there's this relationship that we have, saints, with this relationship that we have in the kingdom that we can, that we have the ability to bring. God wouldn't tell us to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth, it was in heaven, if, it, if we didn't have some kind of part to play in it. It's like saying, God, we give you permission to come to the earth and do what you want to do. Isn't that like ludicrous? He's going to do what he wants to do, right? But he has chosen in his sovereignty to partner with mankind to bring everybody into the kingdom, to bring for us to, the, for us to be his extension. Jesus told his disciples, when I leave, greater works than these you will do. Greater works than these you will do. He says, I have to go. I have to go so, we can send, so the Father and I can send the Holy Spirit so you can be empowered and baptized in the Holy Spirit so that 12 men can turn the world upside down is what it says in the book of Acts. 12 men. Turn the world upside down. He's looking for one man to stand in the gap and pray. So are you going to turn the television set off and get the prayer guide out and start to pray? Or are you going to watch another rerun of I Love Lucy? And Gilligan's Island. What else? What is it? What is it? Bonanza. Bonanza, yeah. Rawhide, Bonanza, and uh, what's the other one? Deep Valley or hidden, some kind of gun smoke. Yeah, gun smoke. Yes, gun smoke. Have Jesus will share. Right, gun smoke. Have gun will travel. Have Jesus will share. That's what we should all have little cards. Pull them out. I have Jesus and I'll share. You want Jesus? I'll share him with you. Amen. Awakening in America would be right here, 2850 Jack Street. And from here, the ripples would go out all across western Pennsylvania to the east coast. West Coast and all the, way back, all the way around the other side of the world in all directions, east and west. Cover the sphere of, of it, man. Be awesome. Be awesome. He's looking for somebody. Moses is in the wilderness with the, with the uh, children of Israel. They're walking through the wilderness. And they're, it's amazing to me, but it's just ungodly human nature. These guys didn't have the Holy Spirit dwelling in them like we do. And they were rebelling, and they wanted to go back to the land of Egypt because they missed the onions and the leeks and the garlics. They were tired of eating manna. So, and they were, they were just complaining. And God was, had it, was up to here with it. He turned to Moses, he says, Moses, step out of the way. I'm going to wipe out all of them. And from your loins, from your reproductive organs, from your loins, I'm going to raise up a people who have a heart for me, a people that will serve me and worship me, and I'll deliver those people into the promised land. And Moses said this, God, do not do this evil that you have purposed in your heart to do against your children, because all the nations of the world will say, you are powerful enough to bring the children of Israel out of Egypt, but you are not powerful enough to bring them into the land of milk and honey, the promised land that you've promised. You know what God's response was to that? Moses, according to your words, I will not do the evil that I've purposed in my heart against my children. Saints, does that blow you away? I mean, that just blows me away. Why did God go to Abraham and say, Abraham, the sins of Sodom and Gomorrah have cried out before me. 
and I'm going to wipe them out. I'm going to, I'm going to rain fire. I'm not sure what he, if he said he's going to rain fire on them or what everybody said. He's going to bring judgment against Sodom and Gomorrah. And Abraham says, hey, God, would you, and I, get, I always get the numbers wrong, would you destroy Sodom and Gomorrah if there were 50 righteous people? He's negotiating with God. Can you believe it? And God says, no, I wouldn't destroy it. Would you destroy it for 40? No, I wouldn't destroy it. Would you destroy it for 30? It goes all the way down to what? 10, isn't it? It goes down to 10. And, 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 and Abraham says, God, would you destroy Sodom and Gomorrah? Would you bring judgment upon them if there were 10 righteous people in the city? And God says, no, I wouldn't. And he stopped there. He stopped there. Why in the world did God even go to Abraham and tell him what he was about to do? Right, his son and nephew Lot was there. Yep, yep, yeah. I'm looking for a man to stand in the gap. Yeah, it's good, Dave. It's good insight too. He was. God comes to Abraham. And says, "This is what I'm going to do." And I think if what you think if Abraham would have said, "Lord, would you destroy Sodom and Gomorrah if there was one righteous person?" And he's thinking about his his nephew Lot. I think God would have said, "Ah, no, it's I got to have at least ten. You know, no, you cross the number there. You know, some kind of game God was playing." No, I think if he would have gone all the way to one, he would, have, he would have got it. Which king was it? This stuff just flooded into my head. Which king was it? I think it was uh, Elijah came to him, and you were surrounded, and he says, take your bow and your arrow, and shoot your bow and your arrow. Ken, you know this story. Who was it? Shoot your bow and arrow out the window towards your enemy as a, as a declaration, as a symbolical thing of victory. And he took his quiver of arrows, and he pulled an arrow out, and he went to the open window towards the enemy on the other side of the, of the, of the, of the, you know, the area there. And he pulled his arrow and he struck, let the arrow go, pulled another arrow out of his quiver, did it a second time, did it a third time, put his bow down. And the prophet says, what's wrong with you, man? Why didn't you empty your quiver? If you would have emptied your quiver, you would have been sure of victory. Now you're going to win three battles, but the final battle will be on the fourth, and you're going to be defeated, and all of Israel will be defeated. Why? Because he did not have the faith or the confidence or even, you know, to, for the perseverance to endure to the end and draw all those arrows out. Man's relationship with God, this, this co-partnership that we have, this, this holy place that we have. If we ask anything according to his will, Jesus said, if you ask anything according to my Father's will, I will do it. I will do it. There's a lot of stuff going on in the world right now, a lot of stuff going on in the U.S. of A. It is not God's will. It is not. It is, it is contrary to God's will. It's diametrically opposed to the platform of the kingdom of God. I believe God's looking for men and women to stand in the gap. We'll stand in the gap. make up the wall, the judgment wouldn't come. I'm not sure if judgment's coming or when judgment's going to come. We're living under the dispensation of grace. You know, the Bible says there's going to be a great falling away before the end time comes, but there also could be multiple revivals before the end, before the end comes as well. And I would love to see a, another revival. I would love to see another revival in our nation. It needs it, saints. It needs it. There are you know, there, is, there are so many, it's amazing to me how screwed up people's heads are. Unbelievable. Things that we just take for, things that were just socially ex expected of you, some level of decency and morality was expected of you when I grew up. Whether you went to church or whether you didn't go to church, there was, there was a moral standard that you were expected to live by. We've, we've totally... Destroy that. There is no moral. It's relative moralism. Whatever you determine is right for you is right for you because we don't want to impringe you know, you're on, your, on your rights. You know, we, whatever you think is right is right with you. Scripture says that all men did things that were right in their own eyes. Let's all stand. Worship team, you guys want to come up? I want to encourage you to invite someone.
Invite someone through your Facebook stuff. All, everybody's like into the Facebook thing, your social media, whatever. I want you to invite people to our prayer meeting. I'm not going to preach. We're going to pray. We're going we're gonna to worship. We're going to make declarations. Uh, we're going to sing some. We're going to sing God Bless America. You think it's okay to sing God Bless America in church? Some pastors don't think so. You know, I had a conversation with some pastors that won't put the American flag on their, in, their, in their church because uh, it somehow distracts from Jesus. You know, I don't know if any of you, I'm not trusting in America for my future, for my prosperity. I'm not trust, my trust is not in politicians. My trust is in Jesus. He is my provider. He's the author and finisher of my faith. That which he's promised to me, he will fulfill. That's where my hope is. I'm hoping in him. But I want a, I want a righteous, I want a moral society whereby we can freely express our Christian faith, where we can partner with the Holy Spirit for the great harvest. Scripture says, Look unto the fields, for they are ripe unto harvest. I pray almost every day that God would raise up laborers for the harvest. He would raise up right in here laborers for the harvest. He would bring people into here that would be laborers for the harvest that we might see uh, his kingdom come and his will done to see all men saved, to see, to see that happen again. I'm done. Go ahead, guys. I'm not done, but I've got to quit.